Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you might be joining from. I am HR Funk, and this is my firing line. And this is the firing line for April 11th, 2024. And this is the only online firearm show that's completely driven by you, your comments, and your questions. Otherwise, I would be out practicing my dance moves right now for the next time Mimi and I attend a wedding reception. And if you ever saw me at a wedding reception dancing, you would know just how badly I need that practice. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, Mimi usually tries to avoid the dance floor with me at all uh, uh, costs, even though I'm constantly trying to drag her out there. That might have something to do a little bit with the, <laughs> some uh, uh, adult beverage consumption that takes place there. But uh, nevertheless, I'm out there trying to cut the rug. Hello, Josh. Glad to see you made it here. Um, I've got a few things to uh, discuss th this afternoon. Beginning with the fact that it's just a miserable day here in Ohio. I feel like I am trapped inside the house. Uh, normally, this is the time of day I would be out on the range. I would be out recording video. I would be out doing all that, uh, taking Chewy for a walk, all that kind of stuff. And instead, I am just trapped here today as the weather sort of drifts back and forth between an absolute downpour and just a plain steady rain. <laughs> just not the kind of day that's fit for anything other than sitting in the office and conducting a live stream, which is why I'm doing that. Um, th there's been some uh, odd things the last couple of days going on on the channel, and I don't know how many of you might have caught the short video that I produced a couple of days ago, and I, in the, the video I talked about it, it was driven by this uh, thing that I've noticed lately with uh, so many people in videos, if they're shooting a firearm, it's like they're doing mag dump after mag dump after mag dump. And it, it's been concerning me just a little bit, I guess. And I produced a video where essentially I said just... You know, if, if you like to shoot that way, that's fine. I don't care if you have the money for the ammunition and that's the way you like to shoot, then, you know, more power to you. But I have a concern that people in a defensive situation might be uh, inclined to emulate that type of shooting. And I wanted to emphasize the fact that in a defensive situation, you know, any shots fired have to be uh, reasonable based on the uh, belief of the person who is firing those shots that they are in imminent danger of being seriously injured or killed. And if the imminent danger goes away, then that individual is obligated to stop shooting. Any shots fired after that could potentially be deemed, uh, deemed illegal and could lead to some legal ramifications for the person firing those shots. And I uh, have probably gotten more blowback on that than any video that I've posted recently. And a lot of it is um, fairly, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the right word to characterize it. I guess hostile comes to mind. And I'm not entirely sure the message is one that's intended to try to help keep people out of trouble. And uh, the response to it is as though I've, you know, posted something antagonistic or or disrespectful or whatever. Uh, it's kind of surprising. And I was talking to uh, someone else earlier this morning about this. I, it, it seems to be that here of late, there's a, an idea or or an attitude, I guess, growing maybe amongst the firearms community where it's sort of a aggressive or um, I'm trying to think of the, the right word again. Usually I'm not at a loss for words, but I am today. Uh, it's, it's kind of this, instead of thinking of firearms from a defensive mindset, it's almost looking at them in an offensive matter or, or manner as though someone is going to be taking the fight to whoever. I, I don't know who the whoever is, but it concerns me a little bit and it's been worrying me some, which is why I posed that uh, video in the first place. And again, the response to it has not been tremendously friendly. So I don't know if any, any of you saw that. If you didn't, you might want to take a look at it so you know what I'm talking about and obviously take a look at the, the uh, comments that are in the comment section there. And Josh says that he's enjoying his days off, even though he's been sick the last few days. Um, 
virus from the jail food and and poison from the army got me the last few days. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Josh. Uh, hopefully, you'll be up and around pretty soon. Um, beyond that, uh, I don't know how many of you might have what seen the um, sub 2000 video from yesterday, but I posted a range review of the sub 2000. I had the shop review last Saturday, and then the range review came up yesterday. Um, so far, I've been pretty favorably impressed with the Generation 3 Sub-2000. I still have it here. In fact, you can't see it. It's down on the floor behind me there. Uh, and I plan to do some more shooting with that. I want to use it for some uh, different sorts of tests. I, I think it's kind of fun to have a pistol caliber carbine available to you know, do some different uh, like chronograph testing and comparisons and uh, some terminal ballistic testing and things like that. So I'm looking forward to getting into that, uh, hopefully soon, if it ever stops raining outside. <laughs> and again, that's my big problem for today. And that's really the reason for this uh, live stream today. And it's been a while since I pose, posted, and I keep saying posed instead of posted. It's been a while since I posted a uh, unannounced live stream. So hopefully anybody that's been able to tune in is enjoying it. So far, it looks like the only person here is Josh. Uh, Although it says over here on my ticker that we've got 16 people that have uh, joined in to watch. So by all means, check in, say hi, let me know who's here. But uh, if you were not able to click in for the live stream, <laughs> then by all means, I, I hope you enjoy the replay later on when you get a chance to watch this. Uh, Josh put, uh, feel good for now, just stuff my nose from allergies. <clears throat> Oh, just a stuffed nose from allergies. Well, good. I'm glad you're feeling a little bit better. Um, what's an optic for an AR y'all recommend? So far, I'm leaning towards the Vortex Crossfire Red Dot. Uh, a friend has one on an AR and loves it. The first thing I'll say about an optic on an AR is much like anything else that involves firearms or a decision when it comes to firearms, it's going to be driven by what you're planning on using that AR for. If it's going to be a range toy for close-up shooting, then probably a red dot is going to be fine. And there are a lot of them out there. You know, they're you know, pick the red dot. <laughs> uh, it's probably going to do good as long as it's AR appropriate. I mean, if you have something that that uh, should never be on top of an AR that's you know only fit for an uh, airsoft gun or something like that, then that might not work so well. But uh, I have tested a number of them over the years. A lot of you know that I like Hilux optics, although I don't think they're offering their MM2 red dot sight at the moment. But you know, SIG has got a lot of them out there. Uh, everybody has got a lot of them out there. I actually have here in front of me another Siley optic that they sent me for review. This is the Wolf 2. So this is going to be coming up in a video in the near future. And I believe they're going to be sending me another one of their AR appropriate optics, which is the T10, which is a very affordable optic. So I'm looking forward to, for, to uh, testing that one to see how it's going to hold up and how it's going to perform. Um, again, there's just a ton of AR appropriate red dot optics out there. So you're not going to have any shortage in looking for one or coming up with one to be able to use. But again, that's going to be if you're firing at relatively close, close distances. I was using an AR or a red dot optic rather for the um, uh, Keltec Sub 2000 in my last video out to a distance of 100 yards as a three minute of angle dot. And I didn't have any problem keeping shots on you know, a human size silhouette at that distance of 100 yards. So, you know, they're they're good for extended ranges as well, but I think they're at their best for closer distances. Uh, Gideon Optics is one that I've recently become aware of, and they have a good red dot optic that would be AR appropriate. And I like it because it's got the circle dot reticle, kind of like the, um, um, oh, shoot, the name just went right out of my mind. The EOTEX, that, that left me for a second. And of course, EOTEX are out there. <laughs> they're good optics, but also they're a little bit more pricey. Uh, Vincent P is here. Glad you're here, Vince. Uh, Lance Kelly is here. Uh, might take it out to 300, 350 meters. That, see, for that distance, I would like some magnification. 
you know, if you get into the uh, low power variable optics, the one to fours, the uh, I've reviewed tons of them over the years. Um, the uh, uh, the Hilux optics one that's the one to four power that they use for competition. Uh, XTR, the across the core scope, that's out there. Although that's got a reticle that's a little bit more appropriate for target work. If you look at the uh, loophole low power variables, I've got one of those that I have on my service rifle that I use the um, um, the patrol optic, and I cannot. It's a one to four power scope, has a red dot, one minute of angle dot in the center of the reticle. And I cannot think of the name. I, my, my memory is going already on me. But um, loopies are out there. There's just a ton. Again, SIG has quite a few of them in their MSR line. So uh, for that kind of distance, personally, I would like a little bit of magnification. One to four, one to six. Again, there is just a ton of them that you can choose from. Uh, reason I say I was issued an M68 CCO red dot, both basic, uh, which is why I'm trying to get a red dot for this AR. If you're looking for something like that, I would say try to get something that's going to replicate the one that you're issued. So you're training with the same thing you're going to be using for a duty optic. Bubba the Kid trying to decide between a Remington 700 SPS threaded 20 inch or 16.5 inch uh, going to run a rugged Alaskan 360 on it, uh, thinking of a reload with subsonic and rarely go out past 300 yards. Um, if you're going to be sticking to what I would call relatively close ranges for a rifle like that, which would be 300 yards and in, um, if all you're doing is punching holes in paper, that's the only thing you're ever going to do then the 16.5 inch is going to make a, a compact, lightweight firearm to be able to transport, get in and out of rifle cases and all that kind of thing. If you're going to actually shoot things that, uh, well, living things, we're going to use for any kind of hunting or anything where you know the bullet velocity and energy is going to be a factor, then I would opt for the 20 inch. And I don't think you said what it's chambered for. So that would be helpful information as well. I, and as I was talking, I was thinking of my own collection uh, where I was thinking 308 Winchester. I would probably go the same route with a something like a 556 or a 223. If you're looking at some other cartridge, then that might have a bearing on it as well. So let me know what, what you're planning on shooting through that Remington 700. Josh Twyman, when I build a higher end AR uh, for a patrol rifle or just a nicer AR, I want to try a holographic or magnifying combo. And you can get both of them as far as that goes. You can get a magnifier to go along with your holographic sight. I've always liked the EOTEX. You know, EOTEX went through a rough patch there for a while where they were uh, kind of frowned upon. And there was this idea that there was some kind of thermal shift that would take place. I tested an older EOTEX in all kinds of different temperature conditions. And I tried to make sure that I kept my ammunition at a constant temperature and there was very, very little uh, difference in the point of impact from, I think I had temperatures as high as well over 100. I would, I, I would have to go back and look. It was 105, 110, something like that, because I had it inside my Jeep and it was a very hot day and I took it out, went right onto the range. But I kept my ammunition constantly at about a temperature of 70 degrees. So I saw a very, very little shift in impact, point of impact. I think I was shooting at 50 yards from uh, uh, the very hot temperature to down where it was right around zero. And again, I kept the rifle in that uh, extreme temperature, but I kept my ammunition at a more moderate, around 70 degrees. I kept it uh, temperature controlled and there just was not that much. So I, I still like EOTech sites. 
And I think they've bounced back somewhat from those days when everybody was so concerned that the EOTech was going to have the dreaded thermal shift. Uh, Sir Gromulus, re agree with your comments, reference mag dumping, uh, even if just for the economic impact. I know. <laughs> and I hear these guys on the range, you know, bup, 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 bup. and I'm thinking, man, you just wrapped through like $5 worth of ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> in not very long. I, I don't know. I I guess, and part of it is probably just me. I'm always more focused on precision and accuracy than I am volume of fire. And maybe that's one of those never the twain shall meet kind of things. Fan of firearms. Hi, HR. Hope you're well today. Thank you. Hope you're doing well too. Uh, Bubba the Kid, 308 Winchester. Yeah, again, if you're just looking at punching holes in paper, probably the 16.5 inch is going to be just fine out to that distance you're talking about. Uh, if you think you're going to use it for anything that's living and breathing, I would probably go with the 20 inch just to get a little bit better uh, terminal uh, performance. Josh Twyman, so far when I get the higher end AR, I'm going to get an EOTech, but it's probably going to be five years. Hopefully EOTech's still around in those uh, days. By the way, I got something today from someone else talking about the gun show loophole that's going to be closed. Have you guys seen that? Where supposedly the ATF is adopting a new final rule. The ATF and their final rules here lately are kind of annoying. But the whole thing has to do with people that are selling firearms at gun shows who are not FFLs, the so-called private collections. And supposedly they're going to try to crack down on that. Uh, I just saw a blurb on it today. I'm not really up to speed on it, but I wanted to get that information out there. Oh, by the way, talking about information I want to get out there. I got another text message today from Jeremy Kahn. If some of you saw my interview with him a while back, from Control Solutions. If anyone is interested in any of the muzzle brakes that are produced by Control Solutions or any of their other products, they are having a special 15% off through April the 16th. And you have to use the passcode. And where is the passcode? Okay, there it is. Tax is theft, all one word, T A X I S. T-H-E-F-T will get you 15% off from Control Solutions through April the 16th, <laughs> the day after tax day. So I wanted to be sure to mention that as well. J78 is here. Hi to you. Sir Gromulus, I use a Hollow 10 HS510 green dot on my shorter AR. <clears throat> but a one to six power L, uh, LPVO on the 16 inch one. Yeah, I've got, depending on which rifle it is, I've got some of them that are set up with just a red dot, which are, uh, I'm envisioning for the closer range work. I've got some of them that are set up with scopes. I've got one of them that's got a 14 power scope on it. So it just all depends on what I'm going to be using that rifle for. Run Run says, good afternoon. I have a question regarding the deployment speed of the Sub-2000 Gen 3. How fast is it compared to the Gen 2? I, it seems to me that it's just a touch slower because of the rotation. And as you've seen in the video, it takes just a little bit more to lock it into place. Where it seems like the Gen 2, when I unlatch it, it just flips over and locks into place. Now, we're talking probably, I don't know, hundreds of a second. So it's not a huge difference. And as I said in the videos, when the newer Gen 3 wears in a little bit, it might be just as fast. I don't know. But it just seems to me that the Gen 2 is a little bit quicker. But then I have to take the instant with the Gen 2 to rotate my optic into place. So if you're using a Gen 2 Sans optic, I think it's going to be just a smidge quicker. But if you want to use the optic, then it's probably going to be about a draw. In fact, the Gen 3 might be slightly faster using an optic. Might be another good test to do one of these days if I can uh, ever get out to the range once it stops raining and it's actually storming now. I just heard some thunder outside. Robert, Robert, hello to you in Connecticut. 
Josh Twyman believed people just bag dump because of uh, reduced attention spans to look cooler. Could be right. Could be right. And, and we see that on YouTube all the time. And there's this, um, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's just a difference in philosophy, thinking, whatever, where I've always thought of firearms as being number one defensive tools because of my my background obviously number two for leisure time activities hunting uh, uh match shooting uh, both of those are basically precision shooting i mean you don't spray and pray when you're hunting or when you're shooting in precision rifle matches and then lastly the constitutional reason for for firearms protection which is to abolish a tyrannical government which heaven forbid we would ever come to that point in our country but uh there, there's this, I guess, emerging attitude out there where everything is this extreme shooting to, to uh, I don't know what, make a point to, to uh, might, sort of a might makes right kind of thing. And we're, by God, going to be the mighty ones and, and shoot like, I don't know what, shoot people to pieces that don't agree with us. It's, it's kind of a frightening and unsettling thought that uh or or mentality maybe i should say that seems to be developing out there and i would really like to see it turn around but i don't know that it's going to and i think it's furthered by a lot of my fellow youtube firearms folks out there joe jones good afternoon to you Oh, by the way, uh, if anybody wants to join as a guest, shoot me an email at hrfunk at zoominternet.net. I will send you a link to the video here, and you can join as a guest. If you, when, when you get the link, it walks you through the process to join. You can either join by voice only, meaning that there's you're, you're not going to appear on the other side of the screen, or you can appear uh, visually as well. And if you do that, then obviously people can see you, people can hear you. So if you want to appear as a guest and we can have a two-way conversation, by all means, send me an email. Let me look quick and make sure I haven't received one that I just didn't know about. I don't think I have. I don't think I've heard the email make any sort of a ding. Um, more comments on that short video I was talking about. <laughs> but no, it looks like nobody has tried to, to uh, chime in to join the show yet. But if you'd like to send me an email. Uh, Sean Zimmerman, hello to you. Hope you're doing well also. And Gunmetal uh, Gun Metal Guy USA is here. So I think I'm all caught up. Says we got 28 people that are currently watching. So that's outstanding. Thanks to all of you. <clears throat> And I thought of something else I was going to tell you about, and now I cannot remember what it was. <laughs> We've got a good video coming up on Saturday. I hope you can make it for that one. Uh, that's going to be an update on uh, a previous firearm that I talked about, one that went back for a recall. So it's coming back from the recall repair, and I have a uh, report on how that all went. So hope you can make it on Saturday morning. That will premiere at 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And if you join in, you'll obviously be able to be part of the live chat that will take place during the video premiere. And something I've been doing lately, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but uh, probably once a month or so, I might do one of these when I have one that I think is going to be a good candidate, is when I'm premiering the video at 8 o'clock in the morning, I basically am premiering it on a live stream so that I can talk just like I am now. But I can show the video, and then my part of the screen is reduced over here to the corner. And then I can come in and it gives some additional information if I've forgotten to put something in the video or if I learned something from the time the video was finished, I can then annotate that in real time as people are watching. I can also address any questions you have. So something that's kind of fun. If you've seen that, let me know what you think of it. I've done it now twice and I really kind of like it. Uh, anything that allows me to uh, interact with all of you easier and more efficiently than I do just through the videos is something I like. And I saw a couple of more comments 
chime on here. Uh, what do we got? Uh, Sean Zimmerman telling everybody to make sure you click chat only if you're not. Yeah, if you're not wearing anything, please um, just do the the voice only. And obviously, if you come on as a guest, please try to keep everything uh, at least PG rated during the course of the conversation. Fan of firearms, been shooting my inner arms PPK a bunch recently and was wondering how yours is holding up. My, mine is fantastic. Um, it is one of the last of the uh, PPKS models that was made by Smith & Wesson when Smith & Wesson was building them uh, on license from Valter. And uh, it's just a tremendous firearm. It, it runs incredibly well. It's accurate. It's fun to shoot. Uh, I carry it pretty routinely, and it's just, it's truthfully one of my favorite handguns. I told the story in the review that I uh, um, had wanted a PPK forever, and yes, a lot of it has to do with the James Bond movies and sort of that mystique that comes from them, but also the PPK is a very historic firearm, and I am a student of history, so anything like that that I can look back on to the early days of semi-autos and the development of the double action, single action trigger system and its historical use by Germany primarily, but uh, other users as well, I just think is a, a fascinating history, even absent the James Bond connection. So I had wanted a PPK forever. I finally got one and I absolutely love having it. It's one of those that's never going to leave my collection. Uh, who made it for inner arms? There were two different companies that made it for inner arms. One of them was Ranger Manufacturing, which was here in the United States. And there was also a French manufacturer. Um, and I cannot remember the name of the French company, but this was during the time uh, in post-war Germany, their uh, firearms companies were not allowed to build firearms, at least not in Germany. So Walter licensed many of their designs to other companies outside of Germany to build. And the French manufacturer was the one that was building the PPK. It was imported to the United States by inner arms. And again, Ranger Manufacturing also built some of them. And then inner arms went under. And I think there was a period of time where the PPK was not coming into the U.S. until they struck up the business relationship with Smith & Wesson. And then Smith & Wesson went back to building them. And somewhere in here, uh, I don't know exactly what year it was, but German companies were again able to build firearms in Germany. But even so, Smith & Wesson was building them. That started somewhere around 2000, 2001, and went through roughly 2011, 2012, something like that. And now Valter has their own manufacturing facility here in the United States in Arkansas. And they're once again, building the PPK and the PPKS there. Run, run. Thanks for answer. Have a sub 2000 gen two as a backpack rifle for hiking and stuff. Deployment speed is essential for me for wild animals when they show up. And, and you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, I don't know that I would have the sub 2000 folded in a backpack. I'd probably have it in a sling hanging on my person. So if I needed it, there would be no unfolding, no nothing. I would just have it available to use. Now, again, that would be if you were out in the middle of nowhere, if you're walking down the street <laughs> in a, a town somewhere, then that's probably going to draw some uh, unwanted attention to you. Vincent P. saw your post today. Was wondering if you have uh, a thought about doing a comparison video between the 1076 and modern 10 millimeter offerings. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Um, I'll think about that. By the way, if you didn't see that, I did post something this morning. I, I talked about this previously in another live stream. I don't think it was the last one, but it might have been one or two uh, prior to that where I was thinking about doing this throwback Thursday idea and going back and picking a firearm video because I've now been on YouTube for, let's see, over 11 years, like 11 and a half years. Is that right? 
I think it's going to be 12 years in December. So I've got over a decade, we're almost a thousand videos. I'm up to 940 some videos that I posted on YouTube over the years. And I know I've picked up a lot of new viewers and a lot of new subscribers over the years that may not realize a lot of these older videos even exist. So I thought, you know, maybe I should go back and pick some of these that um, I think are pretty good videos and put them up here on a throwback Thursday thing. So if you see that come up in your, your uh, feed from YouTube and you see it's throwback Thursday to whatever, and it looks like a firearm that you might be interested in, click on it. Now it's going to be me from some point in the past. So I might look different. Uh, my presentation style is probably going to be different, but hopefully the information is still good. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for videos that I posted years and years ago that I think still have uh, information that's going to be good for anybody that watches it. And uh, I'm going to try to post those on what I'm calling Throwback Thursday. And maybe eventually I'll do some updates on some of these firearms. Like the 1076, I still have in my collection. It's resting right here beside me in the safe. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll do a update on it, talking about how it's performing now as opposed to back then, or what I've learned about it over the years, or maybe how it compares to some more modern offerings. So I'll keep that in mind. Manhuren, that's the, I, I, you know what? I was thinking that, and then I thought, nah, I think I'm confusing that with the revolver manufacturer. So thank you for clearing that up for me, Vincent. I appreciate it. Uh, J78 watched the 10, uh, 1076 video and thought it was awesome. Well, good. I'm glad you liked it. Floridian, good afternoon to you. Thanks for joining. Sean Zimmerman, congratulations on 900 plus videos. I, thank you. I, Sometimes that's uh, kind of amazing for me. I, I think about that and I think if the average video of those 900 is, I don't know. I, I wish YouTube told me what the average video length was. I wish I had that analytic. But if it was, say, 10 minutes, because I have some of them that are over an hour, I have some of them that are five minutes. And I've got shorts that are up nowadays that are one minute. But if I have 940 videos with an average time of 10 minutes, you can do the math on that. That's a lot. <laughs> I, I figured it out one time that you could watch my videos for something, you know, like, what was it? Like 10 days straight or something like that. Just watching video after video after video. Never watched the same one twice. But I think it came up to something like 10 days straight or something that you could uh, watch my videos. If they had an average length of 10 minutes. Russ Michael says, hi, I picked up my new Marlin 94 on uh, Monday, 357.38. Fit and finish is excellent. I hope to give her a test run this week. Good. Uh, I hope it's a fantastic rifle. I like the 1894s. I've got at least two of them. Uh, I've got a 38 357 that I love. It's one of the 16, I think it's 16 inches carbine, which is a fantastic little carbine. I've also got one in 44 Magnum that's the, I think that one's an 18 inch, that uh, is a fantastic uh, firearm in its own right. Uh, I hope the new ones are every bit as good, if not better than those older ones. My, mine are all actual JM Marlin made in the old Marlin factory before it closed down, before it was taken over by Remington and all that. So I hope the new ones are great. Any updates on the carry comp? Uh, the carry comp has basically become my go-to revolver. If I'm heading out and I grab a wheel gun, uh, maybe I should back that off a step. Still, the most carried one that I have is my 342 titanium cylinder alloy frame 38 special Centennial that uh, just, in fact, I was carrying that again today. It's just so easy to drop in a pocket and head out the door with, so convenient to carry. But if I want something a little more substantial, if I want a 357, that carry comp really has become my go-to revolver. I've semi-retired my two and a half inch model 19 and my three inch model 66 because they're the older classic wheel guns and I don't want to uh, unduly wear them. I want to keep them as pristine as I can. 
Whereas the carry comp, you know, it's a, a uh, matte finish. It's got the strength enhancements of the newer designs. It's the ported barrel. It's the underlug barrel. And that's the one that I've decided to use as my um, working, uh, I guess what I'll call my working compact 357 Magnum revolver. My 4-inch 686 is still the one that I reach for if I want a full-size, full-featured revolver. And that that four inch six eighty six is just a beast. <laughs> That's the one that I did the video on years ago, and I'll probably put this up on a throwback Thursday sometime. I called it my workhorse revolver. It doesn't matter the lightest thirty eights, the most smoking hot three fifty sevens. It eats them all and just doesn't care. And it's just an extremely durable, accurate, and and that. 686 has the best factory action of all my Smith & Wesson revolvers, so I can't say enough good things about it. But if I want a more compact revolver for carrying, then it's definitely the Model 19 Carry Comp. What's your favorite snub nose revolver? I just identified it. That 342, in fact, I put it back in the safe, uh, and YouTube, of course, always threatens to boot me off if I show firearms during a live stream, which is ridiculous. But uh, Otherwise, I would probably have it sitting right here with me. Russ Michael, it's the 18 and a half. Cool. And I think that's 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 a great length. I really like that 16 inch because it is just so handy. It's such a nice, compact little rifle or carbine, if you will. And uh, with the 357 Magnum, still that 16 inch barrel gives you tremendous ballistics. You're going to eke just a little bit more out of it with the 18 and a half, get a little bit more velocity, a little bit more energy, and hopefully you're going to have fantastic luck and fantastic accuracy with it. Lame James, good afternoon. Recently picked up a Rossi Model 95 chambered in 3030. It's a beauty. Have you had any experience with this model? No, but I've, I have handled the Rossi rifles, and I think they look like they're pretty darn well made. I would like to get one for a review sometime. They, uh, by all accounts, are very good firearms in their own right. Jeff Tim says, hello, just got out of the gun room. <laughs> uh, if you're referring to my gun room, that's still non-existent. Russ Michael, yes, my Henry 16, 16 inch, love it too. Yeah, there's just, that's just a really, really nice lever action. It, uh, length. When you look at some of the things like the quote unquote mare's legs that a couple of companies have built here over the years, I, I would prefer the 16 inch uh, lever action carbine with the buttstock because it's going to be that much more controllable. And it's, if, if any of you saw the video that I made, oh man, it's been <sighs> probably six or seven years ago at this point where I was shooting a lever action carbine on the uh, Ohio law enforcement rifle qualification course. That's the one I was using and it did phenomenally. I passed the qualification using a lever action rifle and it did a pretty do darn good job. It gave a great account of itself. So I, I really like that little firearm, even though Mimi keeps trying to claim it's hers. Uh, I don't know where she gets that idea from. And let's see, we've been at this for 39 minutes now. I'll probably keep the live stream going for about an hour. Uh, that's my plan anyway. After that, it's going to be about time to sign off and probably start thinking about making something for supper. By the way, thanks to all of you who have watched the cooking videos. <laughs> something I've thrown in just for fun here uh, over the last month or so. And... I don't know. It, it's something I kicked around for a while just for something different. And so far, uh, you guys have been great. Uh, I say you guys, you all have been great. Uh, the chili video, the meatloaf video, somebody just mentioned the other day that they were making the chili recipe for the second time, second time that uh, since the video had been out and it's not been out that long. So those are fun. Uh, I'll try to do more of them as I get ideas for them. I am not a cook by any stretch of the imagination. 
But uh, the reason I titled those things recipes for guys who don't know how to cook is because it's stuff I can actually make. And I have I said in the, the premiere video, the one where I was making the meatloaf, where uh, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, I was going to mention something that I said in that first. Uh, it'll come back to me, I'm sure. But anyway, uh, that I've just been having some fun with those things. And uh, so thanks to all of you who have been watching those and are trying the recipes and have chimed in on them. So thanks again. Uh, Russ Michael saw the uh, talking about the video with the lever action rifle. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that, that was just fun. It's always fun to go out and make those kind of videos. Uh, Emil J.A., what company would you consider to be the most innovative? The most innovative. Keltec would definitely be in the running. Um, IWI is pretty innovative with their firearms. When you look at uh, some of the things they've come out with, and I'm thinking specifically the Tavor, and they've got now shotgun versions of the Tavor. Um, CMMG kind of, sort of, maybe. <sighs> Smith & Wesson tries to be innovative, but Ah, I've just been so disappointed with some of the stuff that they've come out with over the last year or so. Um, it feels to me like Smith & Wesson is in such a rush to get things out the door, get them into the market, that they're not taking the time to really iron everything out into their designs and refine them and make them the the... I guess the quality and performance level and aesthetics that we've historically thought of with Smith and Wesson, it's just kind of like, how fast can we slap this together and get it out to somebody? I, my uh, review that I posted on that, that folding pistol carbine, the FPC, you know, that wonky latch that you, you push the opposite side to release the magazine. I think that's weird. I, I think the, uh, latch mechanism is sort of a big clunky thing. Uh, there are some other things, you know, no sights, all of that. Uh, and I get so much hate mail on that video. And I really felt like it was a balanced review because the thing was fun to shoot. It was accurate enough. Uh, it was certainly reliable. So it had that going forward. And I tried to praise it for that. But overall, it just I don't know. It, it leaves me flat, and especially at that time. I think they were they were MSRPing for seven fifty or something like that. Now I understand the prices come down some, which is good. Now if they had marketed that thing for, I don't know, four ninety nine something, kind of like the the Keltec is, I would have been much much more forgiving in my review. But again, at that time. You could buy a decent AR for significantly less than you could get the folding pistol carbine that had so much plastic and everything else in it. And I think my review was fair, even if I do get a lot of hate mail on it. <laughs> and now I lost my place on here. Fan of firearms. Any recommendations for someone just getting into wheel guns? I've shot plenty of semi-autos, but I'm not very familiar with revolvers. Um. Again, it depends on what you're going to use it for. If you want what I would call a field revolver, which is going to be full size, full features, you're not worried that much about it being compact, then I would say probably something like a four or six inch 686 would be a phenomenal revolver to start with. If you want something a little more carryable, and you, you sort of want it to, to do all things. You want it to be a jack of all trades, probably a four inch. Uh, they have reintroduced the Model 19, the Model 66. Those would be good options. The seven shot L frames, 686 would be a good option, uh, probably in four inch. If you are looking for a concealed carry firearm, then again, now we're getting smaller and smaller down into the, the smaller K frames like the carry comp 
getting down into the J-frames, but now you're going to lose some features when you get into the J-frames. You're going to lose some controllability, some shootability. So it's all dependent on what you want to use it for. Um, if you're not sure, I would say probably try to shoot some. There, There's usually no shortage of revolvers at ranges where you can rent firearms and things like that. Try some different ones and see what you think is going to work well for you. Of course, everything I just mentioned is in the Smith & Wesson line. There are you know, everything that Colt makes. We've got Henry that's chimed in over the last year or so with their big boy revolvers. There are Rugers. So there's a ton of them out there. I would say handle as many of them as you can. See what you think is going to work well for you. If you can shoot them, shoot them, and then make up your own mind what you think is going to best work for the role you have int uh, intended for it. Um, Sir Gromulus, what ammo do you carry in your 38 snubby? Generally speaking, that 342 I have loaded with the spear gold dot short barrel load, which is a 135 grain plus P gold dot uh, hollow point. So that's normally what I carry in that. When I move up to my three inch uh, uh, model 19, then I'm usually stoking that thing with 125 grain full power 357 magnum ammo. When we get up to my uh, L frames, my four inch 686 or something like that, then I'm up to 158 grain 357 magnums, which by the way, there's nothing wrong with 125 grain 357 magnums. They have a proven track record, but I'm partial to the 158 grain 357s for basically anything four inches and above because now I'm getting full 357 magnum ballistics. And usually, Again, that's what I'm carrying when I'm out wandering through the fields or in the woods or something like that, and I'm toting a wheel gun with me. Unless <laughs> I'm carrying something that's chambered in 44 Magnum, which in the field use, I usually have loaded with the Skeeter Skeleton load, which is the 240 grain uh, semi wide cutter that is traveling at about 1,000 feet per second. It's a hand load that I use, and that's my favorite 44 special load. Josh Twyman, all have a good day. Uh, he's going to head to the farm to feed, it says the lice stock. I think he means the livestock <laughs> and go fishing afterwards. You have a great day, Josh. Thanks for joining. Hot eight, got here late, but I'm glad you made it. Uh, all's at full. Uh, nobody told me there was going to be a party. <laughs> yeah, this was a, an unexpected, unannounced live stream. I talked about it at the very beginning. It's an absolutely dismal day here in Ohio. It's been raining steadily all day. It was thundering a little while ago, so it's not fit for anything. I feel like I'm trapped inside the house. So I just sat down and fired up the computer for a live stream, and uh, I thought I would spend some time with all of you. J78 says, you're right. Uh, I think Smith & Wesson is bringing out a lot of junk. People don't want to just crank out new products. And that's kind of what I see them doing. And and <clears throat> so much of this is bordering on ridiculous. Some of the new m and and I'm an m and fan. I've been an m and fan since they came out in, what, 2005, 2006? But some of this stuff coming out with the compensators and all the radical cuts and all this stuff that makes it look like something from a cartoon, I guess. I look at all that stuff and I think, you know, really? Now... If you're somebody who shoots in competition and you need compensators, you need all that stuff to try to shave all the time you can off your score. Okay, I get it. So there's that. But for anybody not involved in that, it's just, I don't know. I, I, I think it's superfluous. All's at full... Uh, I think, the, I think you meant to say, I trust your reviews. <laughs> it says, I rust your reviews. Uh, even if you get, forget to drive tech. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to hear about that for a long time. If you didn't see my video yesterday with the Caltech Sub 2000, I got out to the range that day. I told the story. I, I was kind of rushed. I was not in a great mood. I got out there, shot my way through everything I needed for the video. There were also some other shooters out there, which 
it would be so nice if I had a range where it was just me, because when I have to work around other shooters, I have to stop shooting. There are big, long pauses between the segments of the videos. Well, I can't monopolize the range. I have to be a, a, a considerate person while I'm out there. So I got all done. I was feeling pretty good. I was happy. The, the Keltec Sub 2000 shot well. I thought I shot pretty well with it. And uh, in my haste to get out of there and get to the next thing, I forgot to do the tack shot. So everybody was giving me grief yesterday uh, at the end of the video because there was no tack shot. Tune in Saturday. There will be a tack shot on Saturday. <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's what he's talking about with that comment. Bubba the Kid, Ruger GP100. Yeah, another good revolver. Uh, I have handled GP100s. I'm trying to think if I've ever shot one. I've shot other Ruger revolvers that essentially have the same lock work. I've shot some older ones back in the uh, Security 6 and Service 6, Service 6 days. So I've shot some from that era. I think I've shot a GP100, but I just can't say absolutely. I, I have shot so many firearms over the years under so many different circumstances between my law enforcement training and conducting training and teaching people here in Ohio that were trying to get their concealed handgun license and everywhere. I mean, uh, I, I have shot so many different things. It's really hard sometimes to remember if it's been a while, what I may have shot, unless it's something that, that really stands out in my mind. Like I was telling somebody the other day about shooting a C96 Mauser. That was cool because it's something you just don't see every day. It was the, the Han Solo pistol from Star Wars. I had a chance to shoot one of those. Uh, this has been several years ago, but that's one that just stands out in my mind. Shooting a Luger is another one. So something like that just has a tendency to stay with me, but some of them, not so much. Mark Becker, good afternoon to you. Started with a four-inch Colt Mark III Trooper and wore it out. That good revolver. Uh, I shot one of those in a video a while back. Dan the Wolfman, glad you made it. Never mind all, all you old men and that little social security. <laughs> Wait a second, what? All you old men, that little social security that uh, is ended won't help inflation. Uh, you, can, you can't sell your collection to pay for your wife's medical bills anyway. <laughs> okay, all right. Talking about the whole gun show thing. I see what you're getting at. There you go, Dan. Stir the pot. <laughs> Russ Michael, yes, I've been taking some ribbing, uh, unfair ribbing, doggone it. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Uh, I started doing the tack shot. I, I think I've told this story before. I was out on the range one day conducting firearms qualification. And one of the officers that was qualifying, uh, there was a, we were between stages or something and a fly landed on his target. I said, hey, let me borrow your pistol. He goes, why? I said, just, just let me borrow it. So I took the, the pistol, aimed in. This was from like seven yards or something like that. And blam, zapped the fly. And I've made shots like that before. I shot a wasp one time with a simunition round. It was on a window kind of bouncing around and it stopped for just long enough. And I had a, a simunition round in the pistol and I shot it and, and zapped it. And the wasp was kind of funny because it sort of exploded when I, I hit it with the simunition. And uh, I, I had made some other shots like that over the years. But when I shot the fly, uh, I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool if I could do that in a video, but I can't get a fly to, to land on the target when I need it to every time. And I thought, well, how about like thumbtacks? They're about the size of a fly. So that was the whole genesis of the idea for the tack shot. And I started doing it in the videos and people seemed to like it. So I thought, all right, cool. I'll, I'll keep doing that. But... Uh, do you ever stop to think how many people on YouTube don't show you anything they're shooting? Now, now Dan, Dan, the Wolfman does do that. He shows you where he hits, talks about his shooting and his times that he gets and all that kind of thing. But how many people you never, you see them shooting, you know, blam, 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 blam. And maybe you hear, you know, ding, 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 because they've got a scoot deal target somewhere down range, but you have no idea where those shots are hitting. And I, I think that's, I don't know. Uh, why why do that? Well, I, the tack shot or even when I'm doing the split screen and I'm shooting at the human silhouette target and all that kind of thing, 
I think it's great for people watching the video to be able to see where those shots are hitting. And, and it, it gives you a better sense if I'm reviewing a firearm or if I'm talking about a drill or if I'm doing whatever I'm doing, a better sense for the type of performance that's actually taking place then if you just see me going bang, 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 or you hear something going clang, 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 and you have no idea if shots are hitting, you know, top of the shoulder, bottom of the kneecap, you know, just clipping the very top of the head, whatever. So I, I kind of like doing that. I've talked before. I, I like to maintain a sense of authenticity in my videos. Uh, and I'm glad people seem to like that. Uh, Mark C. Smith and Wesson shields are better than most 45. Uh, wait a second. Smith and Wesson shields are better than most. My 45 PC is fantastic. All right. Uh, and I shot a, uh, performance setter 45 shield a while back and it is a pretty nice firearm. I liked it. Surprisingly, it did not recoil as much as I expected it to for full power 45 ACP. Mark Burnett, or Mike Burnett, rather, would still like to see you do a comparison between the 8-shot Smith & Wesson 627 and a 1911 from the perspective of which would make a more ideal uh, LE handgun. I would, I still might do that. Uh, that's one of those that I've kind of wanted to do for a while, and the TRR8 is one that comes to mind that I think is actually a 327, um, or the, what's the other one? The, the M&P uh, R8, I think, is the other one. Both of those would be kind of fun to shoot side by side with a 1911 or anything else. Uh, but I don't see those a lot. And when I do, the price is sort of outrageous. So that's probably one that I have to do some trading for. A lot of times when you see something new show up in the collection, something else is no longer in the collection. So uh, I made a trade the other day with uh, House of Pain Munitions. For that uh, Tzosh, um 1911 carry DS, so I now own that. But in order to facilitate the purchase, I had to trade something else for it. Um, Dan the Wolfman, it's anyone, even, even one May 10th. You're losing me with that comment, Dan. I don't know if you're responding to somebody else. I'm not sure what you're getting at there. All's at full. Brandon Herrera shot a weird pistol the other day, a gyro jet, uh, $23 a shot. I I would love to shoot one of those. I have seen them. Uh, I think I've seen them at gun shows before, which nowadays, if it's somebody's private collection, they're not going to be able to sell it. But I've seen them. I, they were kind of a novel idea from back. I think they were produced in the late 60s, early 70s, something like that. But I would love to shoot one sometime. Just, I don't know, to see what it's like to shoot one. But uh, probably will not be able to. And all of you, you're going to have to excuse me for a moment. I got a phone call coming in. Give me one second here. I'll be right back. And sorry about that, everyone. That was Miss Mimi calling to uh, let me know she's on her way home. So I just wanted to take that call quick. Uh, anybody else, I would have just left to go to voicemail. But when she calls, I got to answer the phone or else I'm in trouble. <laughs> uh, Sir Gromulus, I haven't seen the 38 Special 135 grain gold, gold dot for quite some time. Um, hmm, maybe they're not making it anymore. I don't know. I bought... Uh, not a lot, but I bought some of it quite a few years ago, just specifically for that 342 to carry it. And uh, I don't know, I have to go look, take a look at the Spear website and see, see if they're still making the stuff. 
Sir Romulus, you need to head down south a bit uh, and collaborate with Hickok 45 and his home range. <laughs> yeah, I've talked to him a couple of times at the NRA annual meeting. Nice guy. Uh, really nice to talk to. Um, I don't know. I know he's been doing or or his son has been putting up a lot of what they call Hickok 45 clips. And I'm wondering if he's just not doing as many videos these days as he used to. I don't know. I just don't see as much coming from him. And uh, I have no idea how old he is or how long he's planning on doing the YouTube thing or anything else. But uh, I wish him well, regardless. Uh, Mark C, if you want, I have a 327. I might take you up on that, Mark. Uh, I would like to use one. Vincent P, Sportsman's in Shelby, had a TRR8 and an R8 in stock uh, last time I was there. Not, no, I've been there before. Uh, I've been there quite a few times. In fact, I bought a firearm or two over there. From where I live, it's about an hour or so's drive. Uh, actually drive right past my old high school uh, on my way over there. It's about the midway point. And Dan the Wolfman, tomorrow anyone wants the official ballistics data from Federal on the new 25, 32, 327, 38, 9 <laughs> as a video tomorrow. So if you guys are interested in that, take a look at Dan's video. Uh, what time is that going to be premiering, Dan? <laughs> Always answer the boss when she calls. Yep. <laughs> Russ Michael, he still does Sunday morning shoot around. I And I think I've seen the... the uh, notification or the the thing come up on youtube for the sunday morning shoot around uh, i just didn't know if he's still doing as many of the actual review videos and all that that he has historically done all right we are at the one hour point everyone so i think i'm going to start looking at wrapping things up here and i was really Again, I was just looking to get together with everyone today and enjoy some time together, and I hope you all got something out of it. Uh, it's it's always just tremendous for me to to have the interaction that we have. You know, everyone that chimes in, you know, gives great great comments. Uh, I whenever I start the show, I always talk about this is the only online firearm show that's completely driven by you, your comments, and your questions. Which is absolutely true. And and even when I have a guest, uh, if I have somebody come on the show and we're talking about whatever, uh, and again, don't forget if you want to buy something from uh, 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 Control Solutions, you can use their discount code to get 15% off. Until May 16th, the discount code is tax is theft, all one word. So you can go to their website and check out that. They've got the great muzzle brakes that I've reviewed, and they've also got some, some bipod legs that you can get from them as well. But anyway, just the idea that we can come on here and, and have this interaction. The thing that I have always gotten from YouTube, the, the greatest part of the YouTube experience for me has always been the connection that I've made with all of you from around the world. I've got people that I routinely talk to in other countries, people that I've gotten to know, all of you from either nearby or all throughout the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it. And, and Chewy appreciates it too. Come up here, Chewy. Come up here and say hi to everybody. Come here. Come on. Say hi. <laughs> Chewy's being camera shy. There he is. Say hi to everybody. He's looking like, why do you have me up here? <laughs> and there will be another saving private Chewy or training uh, saving private Chewy. I don't know where that came from. Another training private Chewy video coming whenever I come up with a new idea for one. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you all. Thank you for almost 12 years worth of support on the channel here. My channel members, a special thank you to you for your contribution that you make. Uh, YouTube goes on these periodic uh, defunding exercises where everything that I post seems like gets demonetized. And my channel members are the ones who always help me through all that. And all of you who make individual contributions, whether it's on a live stream or you do the super thanks on the videos, Thank you to all of you. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. I hope to see you all back for the premiere video on Saturday morning. That's going to be 8 o'clock a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And if you're there, you can join in the live chat. Please be sure to jump in and say hi, if nothing else. And until next time, everyone, good shooting. Chewy, say bye-bye for now. <sighs>
can never get him to talk. <laughs> See you next time, folks. Until then, bye-bye.